All right, well, I hope you enjoyed the conversation over lunch. Uh, we still have a lot more to discuss here today, uh, starting with our keynote address here in just one moment. Dr. George Harn was named the fourth president of Christendom College in March of this year, and he began his term just earlier this month. He is a widely respected and accomplished scholar of music history and the liberal arts, which is reflected by his resume. Dr. Harn received his undergraduate degree in music from the University of Southern Mississippi before earning master's degrees from both the University of Washington and St. John's College. His PhD is from Princeton University. Since earning his doctorate, Dr. Harn's professional career has included time at Magdalen College of the Liberal Arts, where he served as president for nine years, and his most recent role at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, where he served as executive dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and it was at the University of St. Thomas that Dr. Harn worked diligently to clarify and strengthen the university's Catholic identity through a renewal of the university's core curriculum, creation of new mission-centered academic programs, formation of mission seminars for new faculty, and a culture conducive to the liberal arts. Now, most importantly, Dr. Harn is a husband and a father. His wife, Debbie, uh, he and his wife, Debbie, who is here with us today, uh, have five children. They are settling here in Front Royal, and all of us are very much looking forward to having them as part of the community here in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, uh, for us at Chelsea, we are extremely honored to have him here with us at Chelsea Academy and to be the venue for his first major address as Christendom's president, titled The Contemplative Statesman. Please join me in welcoming the president of Christendom College, Dr. George Harn. Thank you. Please let me begin by thanking John Dijak, Emil Doak, uh, for inviting me and for all those who worked so hard to put this together. I was here yesterday and it was in its final form almost and um, I was just struck at how many hands it took to build this and, uh, and to make all of this possible. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, a couple of caveats before I begin. Um, and these are more for the philosophers and political philosophers who are here today. Um, I want to make, uh, make some uh, caveats for them. Uh, first, though my topic is the contemplative statesman, uh, please know that I am not of the guild of philosophers or political philosophers. I am, in fact, a musician. Um, and that gives me a citizenship in the guild of poets. In light of the theme of this conference and a nearly 2,000-year uh, feud running between the philosophers and the poets, one could argue that it was almost heretical to invite me to address you here today. <laughs> Um, I am a poet musician, um, and, uh, and I should not be talking to you about anything having to do with running or founding a republic. Um, but I think I, can say, and I think I can say without fear of contradiction that Plato would certainly disapprove of my presence here today. Um, second, uh, I do not have any allegiances when it comes to political philosophy. I am not now, nor have I ever been, a Straussian of the East Coast or West Coast variety. Though with much profit in graduate school, I did, I did get to read Father Ernest Fortin's uh, essays on political philosophy. Nor am I a Voglinian, uh, though I learned a great deal from Peter Sampo, who was himself a student of Eric Voglin. But if there are those among us here today of a certain sort who are seeking to find an esoteric or hidden meaning in my speech, and perhaps were inclined to go so far as to count the words in my address uh, to discover that hidden meaning, they would find that the central and therefore most important words of my address will be coffee break. <laughs> With those caveats in place, uh, let us begin. My thesis is simple. To engage in that most active of active lives, the most important of the active lives in many ways, that of the statesman, one must engage above all and before all in its opposite, the contemplative life. The most fundamental act of the statesman is seeing seeing clearly, seeing deeply, and seeing comprehensively. And this is only possible if we establish the practices and patterns in our lives that are conducive to seeing over time. Substituting contemplation for its conceptual cognate, we can say that no statesman can succeed in the role of statesman or even flourish as a human being without cultivating contemplation in a contemplative disposition. Neglecting contemplation 
will lead to grave harm to the common good and to the polity entrusted to the statesman. This claim has implications for us as leaders, as teachers, as parents, particularly in education, and how we form the future leaders in our charge, the curricula that animate our schools, and the ethos in those schools that we seek to cultivate. So first, a map. Allow me to offer a brief map of our journey over the next few minutes. Um, just so you'll be aware, my wife has been instructed to stand up and wave her arm if we go too, too long. So if she starts doing that, um, you'll know what's happening. Uh, first, first question, what is a statesman? Second, what does it mean to be contemplative? Third, what are the objects that a statesman must contemplate? Fourth, what models for the integration of the contemplative and active lives might we consider for our own lives? And fifth, how might St. Thomas More be an exemplar? And what did he learn through his contemplation that would apply to our own lives? So part one, what is a statesman? To this question, we can append several corollaries. What is the goal of a statesman? What are his means? And who or what are his chief adversaries? First, a statesman. A statesman is a wise and virtuous political leader who possesses the art of governing to an unusual degree, who is capable of directing great public affairs, and who acts for the common good rather than out of self-interest. But what is the goal of a statesman? A statesman's goal will be to bring about peace and justice for, for as long as these can be maintained. Though realistically, the statesman will also know that in many ways these are not the norm, right? That we strive for them, but they are, they are contingent and, and, may not, and will not last forever. What are the statesman's means? His means are two, and we'll talk more about this as we go. First, he appeals to reason, and we'll unpack that in a bit. But he also uses lawful and just compulsion. Um, and if we were, to, were to, to talk more about Moore's biography, I think we would find examples of both of those in his life. So a statesman publicly appeals to the personal and public conscience of free, educated, and self-governing citizens capable of spirited public debate. So that's, that's the, those are the citizens that a, a statesman will engage. The statesman will call these citizens to live generously by their highest and historical convictions as expressed through their literature and their laws. And I'll say here, literature is much broader than just imaginative literature. This would include philosophy, uh, political philosophy. Think of Plutarch. Um, uh, so it's going to be quite broad. But note how literature comes first and then laws. And we'll, we'll say more about that in a moment. And all of this, is, of, course, of course, is ordered to the common good. But who or what are the enemies, the chief enemies of the statesman? The statesman's primary enemies are ignorance, which of course speaks to the mind. We forget who we are. We forget what we are. We forget our, na our nation's history. There are lots of things we would forget that could be resolved or repaired by simply learning new information or being reminded. But that's only one of the enemies. The second enemy, and I think many of us who have worked in education have experienced this firsthand, is the tendency toward tyranny and arbitrary self-assertion, which is more a matter of the will. Right? Um, you get any group of people together with a common purpose, and there's always going to be this danger, a danger of not knowing enough, but also that in, for the good of the cause, there will be an arbitrary self-assertion. This is something St. Augustine called libido dominandi. And both of these spring from our, our fallen nature. So we all, leaders of schools and families and other organizations, participate in this idea of a statesmanship to some degree. And we are all called to be contemplatives to some degree. And so insofar as we are forming future statesmen, we will need to form them to be contemplatives. So our students, even the ones who are, who are headed toward very active lives, there's going to have to be a contemplative dimension in how we form them and how we shape them. Part two, what does it mean to be a contemplative? We're all familiar with synonyms of contemplative. Think of speculative, think of theoretical. But notice how those last two words, though they're synonyms, um, they have a kind of a negative tinge. And we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. Why is it that when, when we want to dismiss something, we say, oh, that's merely theoretical, or that's merely speculative. But they're, they're the same basic words, the same basic ideas. And I think part of that comes from the American uh, culture, that, which is very Roman in many ways, that emphasis on action and practice. But that lets the cat out of the bag. What are the opposites for theoretical and speculative and, practic and uh, contemplative? Well, it's, it's active and practical. So these, these are the pairs that we're working with. 
But what is the essence of contemplation? So think of a ship and a crow's nest and a sailor in the crow's nest high above the ship, straining to sea, looking for land, or maybe looking for an enemy ship. It's seeing. It's that kind of deep, sustained, intentional, there's nothing more important in the world, seeing. Or think of, for those of you who know your Plato, think of the, of the, the, the slave or the, the person who was chained to the cave in the Republic, who is, who's emerged and is now seeing the really real for the first time. Contemplation is that kind of seeing. At its very core, to be contemplative, is to be one who sees, who sees deeply, who sees uh, to the very core of reality and in a sustained way over time. This seeing can be with the physical sense, but can also be with the eyes of the soul or the mind. And that's typically what we mean by this. In its higher form, this seeing is not immediately for utilitarian ends. I won't get into the for its own sake or not for its own sake um, discussion right now. Maybe we can do that in the question and answer period. But I think we can safely say that to be contemplative is not um, to be immediately moving towards some sort of practical application. And for those of us who teach, this is a problem because we, we're holding up all these beautiful, wonderful things for our students to contemplate and then saying, oh, we have a quiz on this on Friday. All right? um, so you can read all the paper in the world, but then you have a quiz on paper. Okay? So you know, it's, it can be very confusing for students. So school, the one place where there's scole, where there's leisure, it ends up being the place of high stress and high performance. Right? And that's a paradox that I don't know that we've worked out quite as well as we, we, we could. Um, but contemplation, of course, can also be extended um, to action and be applied. And I, I believe the statesman, as I'm, I'm proposing it today, will do both of those. There will be the contemplation for its own sake, um, in a limited sense, um, but also for application. Um, and we'll, we'll get more into this when we talk about Thomas More in his life. But the meaning of this form of contemplation can be better understood if we consider it in the form of a life, the contemplative life versus the active life. The Neoplatonist, Iamblichus, in his work, The Life of Pythagoras, offers this tale. Pythagoras is said to have been the first person to call himself a philosopher. He said that people approach life like the crowds that go to the Olympic Games. People come from all around for different reasons. One is eager to sell his wares and make a profit. Another to win fame by displaying physical strength or athletic prowess. But there is a third kind, the best sort of free man, who comes to see, to see places and fine craftsmanship and excellence in action, in words, such as, as are generally on display at festivals. Just so, Iamblichus continues, in life, people with all kinds of concerns assemble at one place. Some hanker after money. I'm not sure what the Greek equivalent of hanker is, but that's how it was translated. Some hanker after money and an easy life. Some are in the clutches of desire for power and of frantic competition for fame. But the, the, the person of the greatest authority is the one who has chosen the contemplation of that which is finest, and that one we call a philosopher. Notice that the key action here is one of seeing, seeing for its own sake. Last night I had the pleasure of going with my family to um, the uh, Front Royal Cardinals baseball game. And um, uh, because their father is a professor, my children are used to getting mini lectures. Um, 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 I, I'm known to do it over the dinner table, on the way to some location. And they have different ways of coping, and um, I've, off <laughs> I've, I've offered to pay for some therapy as they get older. Um, so, um, and, and it, it can be kind of a broken record. Um, but I, I mentioned this because I, I said I'm giving this talk tomorrow. You guys know about this, and they said we know. We've heard about this for months. Um, so, um, but I mentioned this story, and I said we're going to the games. We're going to a baseball game, and so we're going. Um, and there'll be different kinds of people there. There'll be people there selling their wares, people selling food. We enjoyed some of those culinary wares um, as the evening went on. Um, there'll be people there showing off their athletic prowess. Um, some of them are hoping to get picked up by the major leagues. Um, but those are people on the field. But according to Iamblichus and Pythagoras, the people who are really doing the most important thing are the people sitting in the stands who are waiting to see the excellence of the game. And so um, I, 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 I sort of continued the lecture as the game. I said, look, that was an excellent thing. You see that? You know, that was a double play. That was excellent. Um, and so, um, uh, but that's, that's the basic idea. Is, and, and I wasn't writing, I didn't have to report on the game for the local paper. There, were no, there was nothing that I had to do. Um, as a result, we simply went there for the pleasure of contemplation. And that's kind of a, a low level of contemplation, but it's real. And I think if we can train ourselves and our, um, 
in our, in our families and the people who are in our charge to do that. That doesn't mean we can just sit on the sofa all day Sunday and watch sports and tell our families, oh, I'm contemplating. Okay, that, that's, not, um, that's not an excuse for that. Okay. But for those of us living in the modern world um, who cannot follow the model of Pythagoras, who, how might we understand and learn to participate in contemplation? In his essay, Work, Spare Time, and Leisure, by Joseph Pieper, um, he offered us four paths. And most of us can enter into at least one of these paths. Some of us can enter into more than one. First, there is the practice of contemplative prayer. And I don't mean um, sort of the technical, Carmelite contemplative prayer. I'm referring to what we do when we, when we make a holy hour. All right? um, that's that sort of silent, quiet, you know, you know, giving our thoughts up to God, our prayers up to God, but then also receiving back what he, what he offers us. A kind, of, a kind of silent dialogue, but just being still. Okay? That's, that's, that's a form of contemplation, and it's a pathway to, to deeper forms. Um, second, there's the making of truly beautiful things. And this can, be, um, this can be making fine art. It can be sculpture, painting. It can be making a beautiful garden. Right? It can take on all sorts of forms. Uh, but again, generally, it's not for some utilitarian end. You're not being paid for it. Right? No one's making you do it. Um, but there'll be a sustained sort of vision that's involved. Third, um, there'll be a kind of sustained philosophical reflection on something that is good. Uh, this, could be, um, this could be some aspect of culture. This could be um, history. It could be philosophy. Um, it could be nature itself. Um, but again, it's something you're interested in. And if you're asking, okay, where do I start with this? Well, what are you interested in? If you had six months just to study what you wanted to study, what would you study? What would you, and that, that would give, some, give you an idea of, of where to begin. But again, it's not for a test. It's not for work. Um, it's, it's because you have a loving, a love-inspired interest in this um, to grow in this area. Um, fourth, uh, we can engage in the contemplation of beautiful music, art, dance, or cinema. We can go to the symphony and just listen. We can go to an art gallery. And instead of trying to see the whole museum, just go to one room that attracts you and just spend that time looking deeply. Um, there's a couple of temptations I should mention, and as a music historian, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this. I might get thrown out of that guild. Um, but that's, it, don't get caught up in the history. Okay? Don't feel like you've got to read a biography of Beethoven before you go to the symphony. All right? That information, that knowledge can come later. But just go and listen. One of Pieper's book, uh, books, um, uh, or it's actually one of the essays, it's called Learning to See Again. And he explores the fact that we as moderns and postmoderns have basically forgotten how to see. We forgot, we don't even see what's there. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that in a, in a moment. Um, in each of these, let them be born of love, be for their own proximate sake. By the way, all of these things ultimately are ordered to God. They're ultimately ordered to the beatific vision and, and communion with the Trinity. Okay, so fundamentally that's the ordering. Um, but I think we know what we mean when we say for their own sake. Um, so these are practices that current and future statesmen can learn to cultivate. And they're, pra they're, they're practices that we can cultivate in our families and in our schools by our own, by our own actions and the, the examples we, we, we set, uh, but also in the ethos and the programs we develop. Um, but you can't really engineer it, by the way. You can make time for it, um, but you can't make it happen. And that's kind of hard for us as Americans to hear. Like, no, I'm going to set up a plan. We're going to do this. We're going to, and then, boom, we're going to have a noetic moment, a contemplative moment. It doesn't work that way. Um, I had a colleague who used to describe it as um, a noose inducer. Noose is sort of the, the Greek word for that kind of activity. You can't induce it. You can create the conditions for it, but you can't. You can't make it happen. Um, so to be contemplative then is to be one who sees, not just with the physical eyes, but with the eyes of the mind and of the soul, to ever greater depths and ever greater heights. Um, and it's a seeing that we as Christians, if we follow it to its end, will be consummated in the beatific vision. So we've begun to answer our first two questions. What is a statesman? And what does it mean to be a contemplative? So a couple questions we can all ask ourselves. Do we have a contemplative dimension in our own lives? Is there time set aside each day and each week for contemplation? If we were to choose to cultivate more contemplation, what would we do? Perhaps more prayer. It never hurts to pray more. Um, would we perhaps attend to learning um, some area that has always been of interest to us, but we've just been too busy? Um, might we engage in the creation of beauty? Um, you know, what, 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 what would that be? Um, or might we go to the symphony um, or go to a museum? Part three, what should the statesman contemplate? And by extension, what should we contemplate as leaders 
and teach our students to contemplate. This is not a comprehensive list. These are just a few things for us to think about. Uh, and it's a place to begin. And some of them are rather broad, as you'll see. First, I would argue that the statesman should contemplate the whole, like everything. Right? What we typically do in our lives is we focus on this one part. And then not realizing it, we make that one part bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes, in some sense, the whole. But if you're aiming to, to contemplate the whole, then in a sense, you're always reminded that your space, your sphere, your area of action is part of something much bigger. And I'll say a bit more about, about this in a moment. Second, the, the, um, the contemplative statesman should think deeply about what it means to be human, about human nature within a metaphysical context. Third, the contemplative statesman should be aware of cultural realities. And by this, I don't mean buzzwords and headlines. I mean, look beneath the buzzwords and the headlines to see, ask yourself, what is really going on here? What is really motivating, motivating, us, motivating us here? Um, and then uh, fourth, the political sphere. Uh, and then fifth, what we might call the eschatological horizon. Some of these are really big. But I think these are things that we need to be aware of and, and have as part of what we're, we're hoping to see more and more of. Bishop and monk Eric Varden clarifies what it means to contemplate the whole when he cites Pico della Mirandola's treatise on the dignity of man. Bishop Varden writes, Pico describes God's intention in creating human nature. Having made earth and heaven, filling them with life, God longed, Pico says, for some creature which might comprehend the meaning of so vast an achievement, which might be moved with love at its beauty and smitten with awe at its grandeur. Therefore, the Almighty set man, set all of us, in the middle of the world as someone fit to contemplate the whole, sensitive to the connectedness of things and aware of his own rightful place among them. Wow. I mean, think about that. that Pico's idea is that this is why we were made was to look at the whole, to get a vision of the whole. That's something that no other part of creation is capable of doing. Interestingly, Thomas More, whom we'll talk about more in a moment, translated and redacted a biography of Pico um, in his life. But this contemplation of the whole will not be a static vision, but more like a dance, in which we are open to all of reality, humble in knowing that we can only grasp a fraction of it, and moving constantly between the whole, the part, and back to the whole again. It's a dynamic vision each time going deeper and deeper into our seeing. Number two, in addition to the whole, the statesman will contemplate human nature within a metaphysical context, in communion and solidarity, ordered to its proper end. This will be a rich and realistic view of the human person placed within, within a metaphysical order, some call critical realism, the basic order and structure of our shared human reality. It will be within what Bishop Burbage, our bishop, calls radical solidarity which is captured memorably in Father Zosima's uh, conversion in Brothers Karamazov and the Russian idea of Sobernost. If you haven't read Brothers Karamazov, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and, and what I'm describing here happens in book six, um, this kind of vision of, of, of how all of reality is connected in a deep, fundamental way and how such a vision can completely transform a human life. Following the contemplation of the whole and the human person, the statesman will contemplate the dynamic of cultural realities of his age. Uh, both his, but his vision isn't limited to just what is. It will always be mediated by what should be or what will be. Today, this would mean understanding the struggles between a culture of transcendence and a culture of modernity. In this case, uh, the culture of modernity is, is what is. Um, and this is, the culture of modernity works against and distorts the formation of the intellect. It places Martha above Mary. It places knowledge ordered to action above contemplation. Um, it makes, it distorts the spiritual life. It makes the spiritual, uh, our spiritual lives just consumer choices um, and not rooted deeply in our own nature or the, the, that for which we were made. And it distorts the formation of, our, of the social and the political spheres. Um, a cultural transcendence, of course, will reorder that. It will, it will, it will pair Mary and Martha in the right relationship. Um, it will affirm and articulate um, what it means to be human and, and what, the, what human nature is ordered toward and it will, will structure the political order in a way that attends to, to the state, the church, and the family, and all of those other structures that are necessary for human flourishing. Fourth, the statesman will contemplate and translate these elements, the vision of the whole, the metaphysically grounded view of the human person, and the cultural transcendence into the political realm. I'm not going to talk about this right now. I'll talk about it in a minute when we get to Thomas More. Fifth, 
The statesman will contemplate all of these realities, particularly the political ones, in light of an eschatological horizon. Hugo Rahner quotes Maximus the Confessor thus, quote, for this earthly life compared to the life to come, the true divine archetypal life is but a children's game. We ourselves, begotten and born like the other beasts, we who then become children and move forward from youth to the wrinkles of old age, we who are like flowers, which but last for a moment, and who then die and are transported into that other life, truly we deserve to be looked upon as a children's game played by God. I think this is part of the double vision, the double vision that, that, was, that Matt mentioned earlier of switching back and forth. Of the political, yes, we're committed to the political, it's, it's really important, the work of our daily lives, really important, but we never forget that second tier, that second vision of the eschatological horizon. What is this, what is this challenge in, in my school or my family or in this political campaign or my organization? How, how does it look in relation to what's, what's to come? What, the ultimate first things. All right. Let's move on to part four. What are three models for how to think about the relation between the contemplative and the active? So if you follow me thus far, maybe you're saying, okay, I'm willing to grant maybe the contemplative and the active should be united in the life of the statesman, maybe in my own life, maybe in the life of my students. What are some models of how to think about this in a deeper way? I'll say there are basically three types of models. One is the biblical model. The great tradition of biblical interpretation has always said, has taken Mary's, uh, Christ's words about Mary and Martha and, and basically said these are types of lives, the contemplative and the active. And Mary chose the better part. But what do we do with that? How do we understand that? Another, another emphasis of this, um, and this goes all the way up to Dante, um, is that Rachel and Leah, Rachel tended to be pretend, uh, proposed as a model of uh, the, the contemplative life, and Leah was the active life. And, and Jacob, of course, loved Leah first. Right? So there, there is a hierarchy. So the biblical tradition, first of all, gives us this a priority, affirms both is important, but gives a priority there. Um, second is the patristic model. Julianus Plumerius noted, and this was, he was writing uh, just, uh, just after Augustine, a generation or two after Augustine, noted that there are at least three ways to think about the contemplative and the active lives. One of the ways to do it is to simply say, is to divide up society and say, well, these people are going to be contemplatives and these people are going to be active. Um, you can do that with religious orders. You know, these are the active religious orders, these are the contemplatives, or these are the contemplative orders, and, this, and then we have everybody else who's living in the world. Another way to think about this is to simply say, and this was alluded to earlier, uh, basically this life is the active life, and the life to come is the contemplative life. So that's another, another, way, another way to divide this up. Or Palmarius says, you can try to combine them in a single life, which isn't easy, even though that's what we're, we're talking about today. Um, also from the patristic period, um, St. Augustine has some things to say about this in the city of God. He emphasized our freedom to choose, first of all, that we can choose the active life or we can choose the contemplative life. Um, but then he provided cautions, all right? He said, no matter which one you choose, there's some things you've got to remember. First of all, whichever one you choose, you have to preserve faith, living in conformity with the commandments of God, avoiding all that is indecent or self-indulgent, and never overlooking the claims of truth or charity. So that covers both kinds of lives. But then Augustine has some, some cautions about those who might choose one or, one or the, uh, the other. He said, for those who live the life of contemplation, they must never forget the service they owe to their neighbor if the neighbor is in danger. If your neighbor is in danger or your spouse, or your children, or there's a crisis, you put down the book and you go help. <laughs> That's the practical application of that. That's what you have to do. Um, he also said, quote, the charm of leisure must not be indolent vacancy of mind, but the investigation or discovery of truth. When I'm t teaching undergraduates about leisure, um, this always comes up. They have this idea that somehow leisure or contemplation is just this sort of mindless, you know, staring at the wall. And that's, that's not what this is. It's a kind of active receptivity and receptive activity. It's a, it's a cycle. It's a circular motion, but you're, it's, it's active, but it's a deep internal active activity. Um, but it's not just vacancy. Um, so if this is what, there are certain activities that people might say, oh, I'm just, I'm engaging in, in, in leisure when I'm doing this, but is your mind completely shutting down while you're doing it? Then that's not leisure. That's not contemplation. Um, but for those who choose the active life, he writes that no man, quote, has any right to be so immersed in the active life as to neglect the contemplation of God. We can't ever be too busy to pray, right? If we're too busy to pray, there's something profoundly wrong. And furthermore, in the active life, and this, this will hit close to home, I think, for some of us, 
It is not the honors or power of this life that we should covet, since all things under the sun are vanity. But we should aim at using our position and influence, our prestige, if you will, if these had been honorably attained for the welfare of those who are under us. It's okay to have honor, all right? It's okay to have prestige or high position, but remember what it's for. Remember what it's for. Um, if one chooses the life of contemplation, it must be properly limited to the true needs of service and charity. If one chooses the life of action, it must always be limited by the needs of con contemplation and a prayer in the spiritual life. There's a third model I want to mention. It's not one that people commonly think of, and it comes from Cardinal Newman um, in um, an essay. Everybody, most people know the idea of a university, um, and they, they often get a, a wrong idea of what Newman believed about education by just reading that book in isolation. He wrote a number of other works on, on education that are extremely important. Um, one of them is called The Rise and Progress of the Universities. He's got some essays on St. Benedict, and that's the one I'm referring to today. It's, it's, um, it's the mission of St. Benedict. Clooney Press, which is an amazing press, just put out a new volume, a new edition of this. In it, Newman speaks of three phases of the church's history. Um, the first phase he called the Benedictine, um, and he associated that with poetry. Um, the second one is St. Dominic, and that's more of a kind of intellectual system building. Think of the Summa Theologiae, think of high scholasticism. And the third is the Ignatian, and that's going out into the world. That's the active life. He makes a point that they're like nested Russian dolls. They build on each other. So, it might be, but so that is to say that if, if you pursue the Ignatian life, if you pursue the active life, at the very core of your being, there have to be contemplative practices. There has to be a, a contemplative disposition. Here's what he says, quote, what the Catholic Church once has had, she never has lost. She did not lose Benedict by finding Dominic, and she still has both Benedict and Dominic at home, though she has become the mother of Ignatius. Things incompatible in nature coexist in her. And I would say that things in, com, incompatible in nature can coexist in us through the grace of the church that God grants us. So most of us are engaged in the Ignatian life, the active life, but do, ha, are we cultivating that Benedictine core? I think those are, those are questions to ask. Now to the final section, part five. How might St. Thomas More be an exemplar for us? And what are some of the things, not all the things, but what are some of the things that he learned through his contemplation. Previously, when considering the things that a statesman or anyone else engaged in contemplation that might have a public role should consider, we skipped over the political side. Um, so I'm gonna begin by giving you a bit of background on, on Thomas More. Um, there's a wonderful book, um, an author, Jerry Wegemer, um, that Matt referred to earlier. This is a book, this book is titled Thomas More and Statesmanship. Um, this is an excellent text um, that I think uh, it would be a great place to go if you're wanting to learn more about Thomas More, the statesman. Um, following his formal schooling, Thomas More gave an additional 15 years to study, particularly in history and political philosophy. So when he could have launched out into the world and left all the studies behind, he continued on for, for at least an additional 15 years, reading as much as he could, studying as much as he could. He didn't leave the contemplative life behind in the sense of learning. Juggling, and he, and he juggled this program of self-education while leading a very active life. And this is something also very interesting that I found in his biography that I think is key. Um, he lived for four years with the Carthusians, a contemplative order in London, and spent at least part of every day praying with the monks and adapting monastic practices to his own daily rule of life. Traces of this time can be found, uh, particularly in his biography of Pico della Mirandola. This work creatively appropriates the life of Pico as a means to adapt monastic piety and practices to a secular context. Then, even after he entered full-time public service and married, he continued to integrate the contemplative and ascetic dimensions into his own life, devoting himself to prayer and study. From his student days and continuing into his adult life, Moore pursued the path of ongoing, what we would call the ongoing conversion and the cultivation of the interior life, assisting at daily mass, engaging in meditative Lectio Divina, practicing mortification, and participating in the divine office, among other things. Thus, Moore seems to have embodied and carried out what St. Augustine called the composite pattern of living, transposing the rhythms and rituals of the cloister to a life shaped by the demands of public service. But this was not easy, and certainly was countercultural. Moore himself, and there are those in the room who can say much more about this, um, was part of an intellectual movement, a larger movement, called civic humanism. And there was a tension between this, you know, do, do you retire? And I think, I think certain writings of Plato would give you this idea that the philosopher really should retire from public service. And, and, and though in an ideal situation, the philosopher will rule, 
that's probably not going to happen. So the philosopher should, should step aside. Um, and Moore and his, and his colleagues really pushed against that and said, oh, there's a responsibility um, to, uh, to, serve, to serve in the city or the state. Um, and so he did that. He found a way to bring those together. Um, but he did this in interesting ways. Um, surprisingly, given the demands um, of public service, he set, us out, set aside Fridays in particular. Writing in his life of Moore, William Roper, Thomas Moore's son-in-law, observed, quote, and because he was desirous for godly purposes, some time to be solitary and sequester himself from worldly company, a good distance from his mansion house, builded he a place called the New Building, wherein there was a chapel, a library, and a gallery, so that on Friday, on Fridays, there usually continued he from morning till evening, spending his time only in devout prayers and spiritual exercises. Right? So this is, he, there, was no, there was no playbook for this. He had to figure this out. But that's one of the things he did. But note that Thomas More, um, for him, contemplation was not just prayer. But it was the deep seeing of anything that was good, either directly created by God or indirectly made through the goodness of human making. If it were just prayer, he would not need more than a chapel. Right? But there was a chapel, there was a library, and there was a gallery. Right? So the definition here of contemplation is broader than we might think. But what was the fruit of this contemplation? Here we can fill in the political content that we alluded to earlier. And I'll, I'll move through these things um, somewhat quickly. First, among the fruits of contemplation, more emphasized the primacy of personal virtue in both leaders and citizens. And this is key to what we're talking about here today. The primacy of virtue, um, both for leaders and for citizens. Um, and the, the idea that there is no institutional substitute for virtuous citizens and virtuous leaders. We can't build the perfect mousetrap so that everyone's lacking in virtue, and yet the state runs along as it should. There's no substitute, either an absolutist prince like Machiavelli, um, or some sort of Hobbesian arrangement or social contract theory. None of those things are really going to solve the problem. Um, so a statesman has to be wise and virtuous. Um, but what, what does, what does the, what's the primary adversary? What's the enemy uh, from, that Moore would acknowledge um, for this? And he would say pride. So I think the homily this morning um, was apropos about the dangers of pride. Um, and pride not only fought, not pride, uh, Thomas More not only fought pride in his own life, he set up the arrange, and arranged the education of his children in such a way so that it would work against, against pride. Um, and for him, pride, uh, pride was the primary um, problem in terms of losing political liberty. So we had to safeguard against that. A second fruit of More's contemplation was that everything we build is temporary. The goal of the statesman is to bring about peace and justice for as long as these can be maintained. Though realistically, these will be for brief periods of time. And I think that's a particular danger for those of us who build organizations and schools, other nonprofits, do other things. We know, we know in the back of our minds, you know, this is contingent, this won't last forever, but it, it's so easy to get caught up um, in, in, in making something that, that you hope will last forever. Um, so I think a wise view is to say, no, this, this will last as long as God allows. And, um, and that, that, that changes everything. That changes everything. And Moore understood this. Um, build it like you hope it will last forever, but also recognize that God has set a time on all things that are, are mortal or made by mortal beings. A third fruit for Moore, drawing upon St. Augustine, is, would be the dangers of ignorance and, and libido dominandi, the desire to, to assert oneself in ways that are unjust or inappropriate. And fourth, um, a fourth fruit of, of Moore's contemplation was that reason and public dialogue are essential but just force may also be necessary. So how do these things work together? Um, I more really believed um, that the statesman would appeal to reason, publicly appealing to the conscience of the citizens, the rational powers of the citizens who were free um, and also educated um, and capable of self-governance, capable of, of governing their own lives, um, and then calling them to live generously according to their highest principles and historical principles. Um, and these, these things would have been expressed through laws and literature. Think of, how, think of the way that the Odyssey and the Iliad uh, shaped the Greek mind of a certain period. Um, and it was a sort of reference to, 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 to action, right, into how one should live. Um, it was that kind of calling to literature and laws, I think, that, that Moore, at least in part, had in mind. Um, and a final uh, fruit of contemplation um, that I want to say a bit more about is, is this, again, this thing about literature. It's, I think it's extremely interesting that literature, in this case, which I, again I think are letters and humane education, um, for him was in some sense more important than law, right? Uh, because think about what's happened since Dobbs, right? 
laws can now be made or changed, but the culture, the stories of our culture, um, the literature of our culture, um, is preventing us building um, a culture of life immediately. Right? We have a lot more work to do on the cultural side. Um, this idea um, that politi politics is downstream from culture isn't exactly what Moore is saying, but there, the ideas are related. There is a, a dynamic here that we have to think deeply about as statesmen and as teachers and as leaders. So, in conclusion, um, I think we can ask how might we integrate the contemplative life, the contemplative dimension into our own lives um, as leaders in whatever sphere God has called us to? How might we integrate this dimension into our schools? Not only the curricula, not only the books we read and the subjects we teach, but in the ethos of the classroom. Is there a, a level, is there a dimension for contemplation in the classroom? It's not ordered to grading, or is every single thing you do all day long, every school day, some sort of order to some assessment that you have to fulfill? Is there room for this kind, of, this kind of, of rest, if you will, in the good, the true, and the beautiful? And do we have any of that in our own homes? Um, that's a hard thing to maintain, especially with small children. Um, but as they get older, they tend to get distracted and get busy. So it never really slows down organically. Um, one solution is to think about technology. Another solution is to think about Sundays. Can we use our Sundays in a different way um, to build this out? Um, Speaking for myself, I'd like to do, um, as Thomas More did, and build a cabin on my property and retire there every Friday. Um, in fact, I, but there's only one problem. I have to ask my wife. She's here. Is that, can I do that? You allow me to do that? I, uh, I'm getting the, we have to talk about this look. That's what, that's what I'm getting. Um, so others of us may take up the patterns developed um, by religious orders, uh, maybe, maybe a third order Dominican. You might, you might borrow on the spirituality and the rule of life of uh, very old traditional orders. Um, or we might draw upon the patterns of life that have been developed in more recent movements and apostles of the church. Uh, many of the apostles and movements that, that grew in the church in the last 100, 200 years, even though many of them are act, very much ordered to the active life, they've maintained the presence of a contemplative dimension. Um, and so I think that we have a lot to learn and we can bring out treasures both old and new. But whichever way we follow, I hope we'll keep in mind, say Thomas More, keep him top of mind, Remembering the fruitful life of statesmen, leaders, parents, and even students will not be possible without integrating, cultivating, and guarding the contemplative dimension. And just a last word. I'd ask you to remember two things. As important as the work of Martha was, Mary chose the better part. And that now we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. Let us begin, begin today, to prepare for that seeing. Thank you. I can take questions. I can take questions. I think Emil has a has a mic. All right. No, Emil has a water bottle. That's what Emil has. <laughs> but there, but there is a, there is a microphone back there. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, worth contemplating. So. Coffee is the active and break is the contemplative. No, the, I'm looking at it right. It's right back there. I'm watching it right. <laughs> so. But in terms of using it as a metaphor, coffee break, I wonder if you could say more about um, contemplation as active, right? I mean, I'm thinking of Aristotle and, and the noetic that it is in a certain sense, you rest, but it's, it's as I understand, I'm maybe, and I'm not a, this isn't my can either. I have a lit PhD, so uh, we're both in, we're the, both in the same the poetic yeah, yeah. Sorry. danger zone. But then there's, I wonder if something about that, that, that it's, it's almost a resource because it's almost, I don't know, more active than what we call the active life in terms of what you're doing with the object. I don't know. I just wonder if you could say more about that yeah. as a rest and replenishment. Right. For daily life. Um, well, thank you. That's that's. Um, thank you for that that relatively softball question. I, I appreciate it. I was worried. Um, uh, I actually, I think. I mean, I I would love to hear you say more about Thomas More's integration of these monastic things. Um, if we have some time later today, um, the I think the thing with um, part about the noetic. A couple things come to mind. Um, 
One is the, the idea, and Pieper talks a lot about this, that the noetic is, is a gift. It's something you receive. Um, and it's, um, it has a divine quality. Um, and it is that part of us that, that is liminal it, between the mortal and the divine. Um, so when we start talking about contemplation and the noetic contemplative dimension, we're really we're moving into an area in which we have to receive something. But to receive a gift, you have to hold out your hands. You have to prepare. So I think a lot of the activity goes into the preparation of contemplation. The other one is in, um, it's, it's in a well-cited passage in uh, Plato's seventh letter. And it's the idea of, of and I'm going to compress the passage, but basically it's, it's two people in friendship engaged in dialogue or dialectic um, pursuing the truth. And then there comes a moment where um, there's like a light that flashes out and illuminates the question, right? But that light wasn't produced directly by the conversation. But the conversation between friends seeking the truth created the conditions. And so I think that that's, I think we can create the conditions for this in our life. So that there's a kind of activity in preparation. But then there's also an activity in holding ourselves open to receive. Um, and that, that's going to involve saying no to a lot of things. A lot of things. Because our lives are filled with good things. And we will, we will drown in all the good things. And we will never achieve that higher human activity. Because we're so busy doing really good things. Um, so a lot of the activity has to be spent saying no um, and letting other things go to make space. So it's, a, it's almost an indirect thing, is what I would say. I don't know, does that sound? Yeah, okay. Yes, you. So who was it that famously said, you know, oh God, give me patience, but hurry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because for me, the idea of contemplation and the idea of patience for a long time spoke of boring, you know, like, all right, what do I do now? Right. Um, but then, after reading Guardini's uh, book on the virtues for about the fifth time, right. and his chapter on patience, I, and I think I might have been reading something else at the same time that was talking about patience, I, I got the idea that, somebody put in my mind the idea that patience is not sort of a boring waiting around for something to happen, but an active anticipation of what's coming next. Mm. And for me, that was a, a great eye-opener right. for both contemplation and patience. Um, and I'm just how do you see that fitting in for someone like Thomas Moore or others or just any of us um, to, uh, to, to sort of try to find the ways to, to understand these things um, that really give meaning to us to be able to then step out, step into that. Yeah, no, that's important. And Gordini, of course, had a huge influence on Pieper. So this is, we're in the same, um, same sphere. Um, yeah, I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is the liturgical year, um, and you know the way that the way that these periods of uh, preparation function of Advent and Lent. Um, there are activities um, that are interwoven with the waiting and the preparation, and I think the idea is that um, you begin to um, you begin to go deeper and sort of reorient yourself for the reception of the gift that's um, either of the Christ Child or or of the resurrection. Um, but it's I think a lot of it has to do with personality. You know, I think I think I think it's certain sorts of personalities. It's almost impossible to sort of wait, <laughs> um, and it becomes an, in, in contemplation it can become one more project. Um, and I, so I think I think we have to. And this is where I think a spiritual director can be very helpful. Um, but um, and I, this is also where I think building out certain periods in the day or the week. You know, for some of us it's the early hours of the morning. Um, for for others of us it'll be Sunday afternoons. Um, but it takes enormous discipline when you're the only family in the in the neighborhood doing this, or the only family in the school trying to do this. It's it's really hard. Um, but I, I think you're right. It's not just sort of, this is a bit like this, the, the statement that uh, St. Augustine made. You know, contemplation is not just sort of this mental vacancy um, of acuity that's, uh, that's present. It's, uh, it is, and this is the dance. Is, is it, and famously in a leisure uh, basis of culture uh, by Pieper, he never defines leisure in that book. You know, and, and instead he sort of navigates around it, leading you closer and closer. And I think in some ways the, the same thing can be said about contemplation. It's, it's, um, is it active? Is it passive? Is it both in some way? And but I think patience is definitely a, a key component. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Hi there. Hello. Um, and you're really happy to hear your love of Joseph Pieper. Uh, and working in education for a while, I, I find myself going back to him time and again. Uh, but his work, Happiness and Contemplation, is another amazing work. And 
there he does get closer to defining contemplation uh, as an intuitive seeing. And, uh, and that's just a very simple way of saying yeah. you know, involving the will and person and receptive in nature. And um, But I'm wondering about the, how do we uh, how do we help our families as well as our schools uh, exercise some of these capacities? And some of this sounds really difficult, but also some of it I think is really easy. And um, so in many ways, kids come out as contemplatives, ready to see the wonder of the of creation. But uh, you know, as thinking about a college campus or your own home. What are some of the things that you do to uh, even foster the dispositions and the tastes for contemplation uh, that, that you think would be important? Yeah, that's good. I'm sure you could say a great deal about this as well in your work with students in, in schools. Um, yeah, well, I, I would say there's sort of the aspirational dimension of family life, and then there's the what happens day in and day out. Um, and so somewhere in between there, I think um, we've been, we have been very, um, attentive to the effects of, of distraction and technology and, and creating distraction. Um, and I think uh, my wife and I have different um, sort of different emphases in this. Um, so I can be more of the Luddite while she's the more practically oriented person. Um, but I, I think carving out um, some clear, well-defined limits about, about what are we gonna, what are we gonna use at what age, what, what aspects um, can be helpful. Because the fact is um, these these programs, these devices, were, are made to, in many cases, to addict us. So it's, it's you know, how, how are you going to compete um, with, with these things that are engineered um, in such a way? Um, and so I think the more you can bring families around you that have a similar set of values, um, and if, if a school can have a very common sense approach to this, that can be helpful. Um, you know, I think Sundays um, can be ideal um, to, uh, to honor that. Um, you know, and um, you know, mass, a family meal, family meals, uh, go for, going for walks, getting back out to nature, um, and really engaging the natural world. I didn't mention it, I skipped over it, but um, one of the things we used to do when my two youngest daughters um, were quite young, when they were still rising quite early, um, that was my shift, because I, I, I would get up and do work on my dissertation or, or do scholarship in the morning, um, is we would walk outside on the front porch. We were living on a mountain in the woods. And I'd walk out there, and they'd walk out in their, in their sock feet or their footy pajama feet, um, and I would ask them, I would ask them, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? Um, and that was, that was a very low level kind of training in contemplation, just asking them to be aware of what's going on um, in their lives. Um, taking them occasionally to a minor league baseball game. <laughs> um, there are all sorts of ways, I think it requires a little, level of creativity. Um, we also, um, uh, early on our family um, uh, started singing Compline at night in English, um, and it takes about 15 minutes. But we've been doing that for a long, long time. And some of my, my kids even say they learned, they started learning to read while singing Compline um, and uh, the Psalms. Um, and that was hard. It was hard with little kids. Um, but just saying, no, we're going to do this after dinner every night, unless the house is on fire, we're going to do this. And um, Pieper's idea that culture flows from cultus. It flows from, from our worship. Um, you, if you try to build culture without cultus, it's not going to work. So that was rather impressionistic, but that, those are some of the things we do. Anyone else? I have maybe one more. Okay, one more. Well, thanks very much for your presentation. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit um, about your own experience as a musician and to what extent music fits into this. Music is probably the epitome of the fine arts, requires precision, expertise, um, beauty, all of those things. And I'd just be curious, from your standpoint, um, whether you've gotten to where you are about talking about contemplation and so on because you're a musician, or is the musician is the musician part of you because you're contemplative? Well, that's that's um, that's an interesting question. Um, I became a musician because um, uh, my public high, my public elementary school, my, I went through public school um, my entire way. Um, Basically, they put all the fifth graders on buses and they took them to the local symphony. Um, it was the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. And that, I don't, they may have played other things that day, but they played the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And there I was, a fifth grader. I think all my colleagues were climbing over the chairs, under the chairs, probably sticking, <laughs> sticking gum under the chairs. Um, from those first notes until the end, I was transfixed. And that was a gift. 
for me, that was a noetic moment. That was a breaking through of space and time in a kind of pure metaphysical beauty. And I was, I was almost pinned to the chair. Um, and when it was done, I looked around and no one else had had that experience, it was just me. Um, and then we got on the bus. I went home and found the classical radio station and all they played was boring 19th century German music. I wanted nothing to do with it. It was nothing remotely as exciting as what Beethoven had done. Um, and it took years, but I started a journey of trying to find more kinds of beauty um, and have, sort of have that experience again. Um, so there was a moment of contemplation at the beginning, um, a kind of excessive, extravagant gift contemplation. Um, but becoming a musician changed everything and turned it upside down. And I've had conversations, um, uh, Elizabeth Corey, who teaches at Baylor, we've talked about this at length. Becoming a musician and being a musician is often more like, um, can be more like an athlete. You know, it, it becomes about competitions, it becomes about exercises, it becomes about winning. Um, and what can happen is you forget the love of the game or the love of the, of the beauty that brought you into it. And I think a lot of musicians are very great technicians, but they don't, they don't experience beauty. For them, even while they're sitting on the stage playing pieces, they're caught up in, okay, what do I play next? Or what do I, and, it, um, and it's, it's very sad. So I think, I think there are musicians who do it, um, but it's, uh, it doesn't come automatically. So I think, I think actually um, becoming Catholic um, and then being introduced by some of my faculty colleagues to Pieper, Pieper's writings, opened up the door back into experiencing music and beauty in a contemplative way. Um, and I think I also had, a, in my, as, a conversion, as a convert, when I became Catholic, um, there was an experience of liturgical beauty. I, I use the phrase mugged by beauty sometimes to describe what happened. That really pushed me toward the Catholic Church. So God used beauty, that Beethoven, and then a liturgical beauty to really turn my life in certain directions. But it didn't come out of practicing an instrument, really. It might be for others, but it, that, was, that was more of a technical workmanlike thing. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.